Hi everybody, my name is Dell, um, and hopefully we're going to be chilling and vibing and doing cool shit today. Um, so, we're watching something from OSP, lovely creators, um, you know, the ones who really be putting in that work and doing cool shit. I want y'all to go into the description, check out their shit, now, thank you. Um, it's actually not a thank you or an appreciation of you doing it, it's purely me telling you to do what is correct in the world and what is right in the world. Um, yeah. Anyways, um, here's also Welcome to Super School. So, this is the trope that we're talking about. I do have, like, my own thing where I, I don't think I've ever created a school for the purpose of teaching people the powers for any series that I've written. The most that I have is, like, individual teachers, never institutions. But let's begin. There's something a little funny and a little more horrifying about how one of the most common stress dreams for adults and kids alike is to be back in school, unprepared for a test, or somehow forgetting mm -hmm. an entire class commitment, or brutally disappointing a teacher. I've never had this dream. I don't relate. Teacher, or somehow all at once. I know I've had all three flavors of Nightmare at one point or another, and I graduated fully five years ago. I did my time, earned my grades, got my fancy piece of paper that says I know what a Markov chain is. I'm free now. Hmm. It makes sense that my subconscious hasn't really caught up with that. I spent nearly two decades shuffling from one rigidly scheduled cavalcade of expectations to another, my so-called free time still defined by homework and test prep. Almost 80% of the time I've been a sentient person for has been spent in the structure of school. It I'm gonna tell you this right here, right now. If you're using American- I don't know about other school systems, because uh, I'm not of those cultures or races or whatever the fuck you want to know. Not races, um, countries. I'm not of the other countries where I don't know shit, okay? But I know this at least. American system. Why the fuck are we doing the things that we do to our children? Bro, the school system don't make no damn sense. I'm so thankful that I got out of there. I'm so thankful that I passed. It's completely reasonable that my brain has a lot of muscle memory about it, which mm -hmm. might help explain the enduring popularity of the fictional setting, The Super School. One of the foundational principles mm -hmm. of writing is- Factor one, write what you know. Yeah. Is the adage to write what you know, which encourages writers to draw from personal experience as they construct fantastical, speculative, and broadly fictional stories to play with, because writing drawn from things the author is personally familiar with has the tendency to be more vibrant and immersive than a completely fantastical concept being built from the ground up. And of course, it's also frequently advisable to write a story with a setting that your audience can understand, and maybe even imagine themselves in, enabling a story to pull double duty mm -hmm. as a form of imaginative escapism. For both of these reasons, writers aiming at a YA or younger audience are frequently drawn my hero um harry potter's the other series and that one about the kid going to hell because his parents sold him into the demon if you get that reference congratulations you're cultured if you don't go search for anime and manga drawn to one of the easy cold reads for that age range, those kiddos probably know a thing or two about going to school. But setting mm -hmm. a story in a regular school is a risky play. Most kids look to stories to think about anything else but school, and it's generally accepted that most people find school to be a mixed Hell. experience. The tropes of the mundane school life are a handful of high highs and a lot of low lows, and the highs tend to be things like prom or the big game or graduation or nope. summer vacation, nope. Nope. notably the parts of school that are conspicuously not school. The tropes of school itself are generally generally very unflattering. The cafeteria food? Mm -hmm. It's gotta be nasty. The homework? It's exhausting if the heroes even do it and a recipe for trouble if they don't. The reading assignments? Boring and confusing. The teachers? Usually mean. The classroom yep. experience? Awkward and overwhelming. And this bad reputation, while obviously dramatized, exists for a reason. Real school, for all its many merits, is an environment that sticks a bunch of kids figuring themselves out from the ground up into a pressure cooker of expectations that they can neither escape from nor control. And don't you love how school is just hell? Legitimately, I feel like you... Fuck the prison system. Just send them to school again and make them have to learn one step at a time. It's like, bitch, I know how to read. I don't give a fuck. Tell me. Read out the sentence. Sound out your letters now. I'm an 85-year-old convicted felon. Like, sound out your letters. Why? Send them back to hell. And when those kids grow up, the good memories and the benefits of their education are often tempered with the background radiation of constant unpleasantness that they went through in the process. But you know what would be fun? A school that wasn't like that. A school dedicated to teaching some- Owl House is actually a really good example, and I completely forgot how I even blanked on this series. Um, I actually like their school system, although it is fucked. Um, the cast system, but at the same time, it's Bellos running it, so of course it's fucked. 
school tends to be dictated by the government. When the government decides to be dumb shit, well, the school's probably going to be dumb shit. And I'm totally talking about only the Owl House and nothing about the real world. Something you thought was rad, like magic or giant robots. A school with a sky-high budget for field trips and good cafeteria food and gorgeous walkable campuses and clean, expansive dorms. A school that mm -hmm. would guarantee you an exciting... Soul Eater is also a good example. Fuck, there's a lot of schools that I know. And no, I'm not bringing up the X-Men yet. I just want to know the X-Men. Damn. Future in something glamorous and fun, like magic or giant robots. A mm -hmm. school that didn't keep you from your adventures. A school that was an adventure. A super school, you might say. The su a training facility for a specialized field that is extremely badass. <clears throat> super school students enjoy training to become wizards, superheroes, or similarly high-skilled, extremely radical dudes. Typically designed to fall somewhere in the escapist wish fulfillment zone. Yeah. Fun Super shit. School is an extremely common setting for kids in YA stories with fantastical premises. It's a fun wish fulfillment location for our hero to spend most of their time in, and it's conveniently populated with a huge crop of characters that share an age and an interest with our protagonist. The Super School mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. great from a writer standpoint because it comes with these fun bonuses. Instant omnipre omnipresent supporting cast. Oh my god, you're right. You don't have to explain why all these people are here. We're here at school just because of you. Well, not because of you, but just like you. Minor nuisance antagonist? Yeah. Major threat antagonist? Yep. Mentors that might even survive. No. No. Your mentor will die. The ones that you didn't know too well will survive. Um, all the world building you can fit in class. Exactly. Challenges, great and small. And protagonists, growing more badass. Provides a starter set of everything a story needs in one convenient package. Friends and allies that don't need individual motivations to justify them sticking around in the plot. Enemies of all flavors and power levels, from neighborhood bullies to cruel teachers to legitimately dangerous outside mm. context threats. Powerful mentors with a decent chance of actually surviving the school year. An extremely convenient avenue for exposition in the form- Sorry, I was- I'm so used to, um, Red putting up one of these little bulletins and then it doesn't have to get read out. And then now I'm realizing, oh, they were just going to read this one out for me. Form of classes about whatever makes the school unique, trials and tribulations, conflict and resolution, the expectation that our heroes will be learning and growing the whole time they're there. It's all very useful stuff, and it's conveniently bundled into the very format of the school setting. They may as mm -hmm. well hang a sign over the door saying, now entering Hero's Journey Step 5. Essentially, setting a story Yay. in a school provides the writer with a gift-wrapped assortment of storytelling basics. A supporting cast already aligned with the protagonist's interests and goals, an outlet for world-building exposition, a potentially endless march of lessons to learn and challenges to overcome. In a more freeform mm -hmm, mm -hmm. story, it takes work to assemble a squad of protagonists all united by a common goal, and to keep them together in the long term. It takes work to explain why a mentor is trusted to guide the protagonist, <laughs> and why they can't solve their problems for them. It takes work to exposit the setting's world building in an organic and natural way. It takes work to introduce new characters and introduce them into the plot going- God damn, there is so much shit to do when it comes to writing. Eh, I'll worry about that when I get back to actually writing books again forward a lot of back-end logistics need to get done to hold a story is it do you pronounce it logistics or logistics huh i think it's logistics I could be wrong. Together in the equivalent of an open world setting. But if you set the story in a structured environment that is literally designed to challenge the people in it, you eliminate a lot of those narrative difficulties right out the gate. Conflict of course, box. there's a trade off, and that trade is freedom for formula. Stories set in super schools may have a lot of the setting and establishing work done for them at the outset, but as a mm -hmm. result, they often hit a very consistent set of story beats along the way. With a super school, and I'm just saying this right now, much like the training arc, I don't see many super schools not at least get encroached upon by an outside enemy not the training arc um the tournament arc sorry it starts with a t and i thought it was the right word um tournament arcs either the tournament arc is going to go all the way through and you finish it or the twist for most tournament arcs is that a motherfucker busts in and starts causing havoc or it gets delayed or just stopped because there's another conflict happening Audience can pretty quickly start predicting what they're gonna get. Now, since this trope draws its entire structure from something- Motherfucker. Sorry, for those who don't have any reference, because it doesn't pop up in chat for y'all, at least, for the people watching the video. Um, it- The astral just redeems something for me to do workout. Um, aka, I do push-ups. 
I forget how many push ups did it say on there? Ten. It's early in the morning too. You about to hear me wheeze. Motherfucker. <laughs> Said just like in school. You <sighs> Okay. <sighs> Let me stretch first before I decide to get down there and decide to make myself look like a fool. Okay. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Oh, shit. Hey, if I fall on the tenth one, does that count? That's that's fair. It, it's fine if I fall on the tenth push up, right? Like that that that's that's okay. I'm not getting back down there. Anyways. Something deeply rigidly formulaic, I'm gonna take a slightly more linear approach to this discussion. Rather than running through a handful of different varieties, the Super School has a pretty consistent setup across settings and genres, so we can just break down the beats almost every single Super School story hits. Mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. start off, in the anatomy of a Super School, the beating heart of the setting is the, the gimmick. gimmick. This is what makes the school super and sets it apart from a. I was gonna say Naruto, but Naruto spent like so little time in the actual school setting. We just immediately went down to like just Kakashi, Sasuke. His one true love. Um, and Sakura, the, um, the one who gave birth to Sarada. A normal and presumably less appealing school experience, and this is also what powers the escapism inherent in the trope. The gimmick can be almost anything, but it usually falls into one of three categories. A highly niche field of expertise, a secret world urban fantasy, or a mm -hmm. spec fic high. In the highly niche field cases, the school is focused on a real subject. It's just not one oh that my there God, are real fucking specialized GX. schools for. Students in these settings will be getting an education in something like card games, or golf, <laughs> or ninja training. The only innately fantastical thing about the setting is that a school this specific even exists. Secret world urban fantasy schools make the super school part of a hidden magical world running in parallel alongside a much more realistic and mundane world. Oh my There's god, Wings Club, Monster High. Movies, wizards, monsters, superheroes, anything fantastical that's being kept hidden from the world. Wings Club was a vibe at large. In these stories, the students typically enter the secret world and the school. I don't remember it well, but I believe there was a fucking like Phoenix arc, right? Where they're in that creepy ass castle, and I don't, I don't even remember what the dude looked like or what he sounded like. It's just his design, the eerie, sleek, shiny bastard with his dark crimson hands and claws. Oh yeah, Evil Bloom existed. Yeah. Well, at the same time, learning about the secret fantastical setting at the same time they get their acceptance. Which show am I talking about? Winx Club. Letter. And in the case of Specfic High, the gimmick of the school is something that doesn't exist in the real world but is widely understood in the fictional setting and is a known and mm -hmm. accepted part of their reality. Students might attend Specfic High to learn about piloting giant robots or hunting monsters or flying spaceships or other fun mm -hmm, skill sets mm -hmm. that don't have majors in the real world. The gimmick of the school is basically the premise of the entire story in miniature, so it's gotta be grabby. This is why our hero is attending Super School and by extension, what they hope to learn there. Of course, first they have to get in, and this is usually an unnecessarily challenging trial for something that is ultimately a foregone conclusion. If a story mm -hmm. is set in a super school, the protagonist is gonna get in. But that means the writer has a free license to make the admissions process as needlessly oh, convoluted God. and implausibly hostile as they want, forcing the protagonist to run a gaunt- Fight the fucking robo-kaiju. Of course, send this at the little children. Then again, you also have to remember that a lot of these damn quirks are stupidly strong. And some of them are weird as hell, so seeing a mega robo-kaiju? And they literally said, hey, they, we don't expect them to win. We expect them to save each other and run away from this thing. Like, that's the right way to think about it. Um, we're not going to program this thing to punch people and smash them to bits. But we are going to let it crush them. Uh, I feel like there's an oversight there. Gauntlet of trials or duels or tests, even though they've often invited them personally to attend, making this all rather dissonant. These tests are also often explicitly unfair, either skewed by a teacher who holds an immediate and irrational grudge against the protagonist, or just deeply unbalanced all on its own. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're also secret tests of character that claim to be testing for one thing, but are actually testing for another. This gives the yep. protagonist an opportunity to demonstrate their natural talent and skill if they breeze through this blatantly unfair system with flying colors, but never fear, even if the protagonist fails the test. 
test, which does often happen to give them a little <laughs> dark night of the soul as a treat, the highest authority in the school will inevitably step in and let them pass anyway. They'll usually yeah. say it's because they admire the protagonist's fighting spirit or heroism or underdog gumption or whatever, but really it's because the protagonist's entry into the school is a foregone conclusion to make the plot happen, and this whole trial is taking place in the no consequences zone, which is why it can be so overwhelmingly skewed against them. The happy ending is guaranteed, even if the protagonist doesn't know that. That's storytelling for you. I now want a story where someone actually gets, like, they don't get in. So instead, they take out someone else, go down a villain arc, basically take someone, they mug someone in an alleyway for their fucking admission papers and just go, giving these to me. I was like, what if I don't want you? Okay, we're gonna just take this leg here, and we're gonna make it shaped like a T, and then we're gonna take this leg here, and we're gonna bend this one up like a U to the side so that your ankle is touching your hip and now that these are like this you can't walk into class congratulations you fucked up as they walk in with your admission papers and they just act as if they're you why did i think of this in such detail i don't know as soon as the protagonist sets foot on campus, and sometimes even a little before that, they will meet their first friend. They'll accumulate a small handful of these before the end of the day, but their mm -hmm. first one will almost inevitably be an even more underdoggy bully magnet than the protagonist. Oh my god, you're right. The fucking bully magnet character. Wouldn't they know the NC didn't get in, though? Well, under this assumption, we're just saying that you have, like, transformation powers, probably. Transformations would probably be the best way for me to explain that. It's like... Where's your power transforming into people? So I'm gonna come in with someone else's papers now. But why? They didn't let me in the first time. I'm just gonna keep whooping people's ass until I get in. Protagonist, a lovable wimp in over their head who's being pushed around aimlessly by the tides of fate until the protagonist swoops in to fill their life with the excuse me he asked for no pickles energy they've been craving. In the rare mm -hmm. cases that this doesn't happen, it's because the protagonist is the aforementioned massive wimp bully magnet and they're about to be oh, God. by the hero of a different story. Soon enough. I think it would be very funny if we took that trope and flipped it as well. How would I flip that? Because we don't want it in either situation. Can we make the bully magnet the antagonist? It's like, why are you being bullied? Um, I, you know what? I just realized exactly what we could do. Make fucking Kachan, um, Bakugo, right? Make Bakugo actually likable in season one where he's the nice person. But instead, we make the bullied Mineta. The bully is Mineta. It'd be funny as fuck to hear Mineta try to bully people only for them to just go, Okay, try to kick his shit in. They'll accumulate a small posse of on average two to four friends, filling some or all of the roles of a typical five-man band. The only mandatory slot to fill is the smart guy, as one of the friends will be an exceptionally talented student who knows what's up and can explain the setting to the audience surrogate protagonist who has no idea what's going on. Either simultaneous to meeting their first friend or very shortly thereafter, our hero will encounter their first bully. This person will be mean and smug, with at mm -hmm. least two hangers-on flanking them to laugh at all their jokes, and they'll usually be introduced bullying wimpy friend number one. At least two... I hate how, like, on the nose this is, because it's so good. It's legit, just like, I can't think of an example that I haven't seen this in before. They come from an affluent family, are generally desperate to impress one or both parents, and almost always immediately develop a massive personal rivalry with the hero that generally turns into a long-term mutual respect friendly nemesis dynamic that can always be relied on for a little easy character conflict, but it sometimes speeds into a quick-o redemption arc for the bully instead, usually when they decide parental approval isn't all it's cracked up to be and being mean feels bad. However, our hero mm -hmm, will mm -hmm. generally encounter more than one bully over the course of their tenure at school, and they fall into four categories. The first, containing the inevitable first bully, are jerks with something to prove. The these guys yes. have someone they're trying to impress, be it a parent or teacher or just the other students, and they think throwing their weight around is the way to do it. Less complex but frequently nastier are the garden variety goons who are just- Ah, fucking hell. It's like, do you guys even have names? Your worst nightmare. Good one, boss. No. <laughs> I fucking love this. The little images are just so goofy and energetic. 
just generally unpleasant and mean fellow students who contribute to making the school feel somewhat hostile. These mm -hmm. guys are often nameless and interchangeable and exist only to cause problems. Because of that, they usually don't get graced with a redemption arc. They're just generally mean and then they just don't show up anymore. Then there are other ones who are hostile for a reason. Characters that have a bone to pick with the protagonist, a reason I've to dislike these. them, a thing they're trying to get from them, etc, etc. These guys often turn into friends as soon as that reason is cleared up, but that's not a guarantee. And finally, there are legitimate villains. Bullies that aren't just mean, they're actual bad guys. Usually yeah. some combination of working for an outside villain and or infiltrating the school for their own. I don't care about My Hero spoilers. Run away if you care about My Hero spoilers. Um, I still believe that the person who is the traitor in My Hero shouldn't have been a traitor. Okay? Sparkle Boy was not compelling enough to me. And I believe that the proper person who we should have made a villain was Mineta. Because at the very least, it would explain his truly awful, awful sense of talking to people. Right? Um, at the same time, it would also be cool as fuck to see Mineta reveal that, oh, you see how I have balls on my head? Yeah, I'm about to start doing some Spider-Man's dumbass combos with the balls and just doing some cool shit. It'd be a reason to make him, like, competent. Because if I have to suffer through that much goddamn horny humor, I want to at least have it come off with a payoff, you know? Or even um, my secondary runner-up for who should have been a traitor was Dinky. His fucking electricity is cool as shit. It would have been interesting as fuck to have him be the traitor because, well, he, it would basically mean that every time he was saying, my brain is frayed, was a lie. I would love it so much that he just goes, oopsie. I didn't realize that it would go down so easy. I, I, I would have loved those two moments, you know, just two obvious traitors. And he would also explain, or even both of them, the perversion duo. Ugh. Because I can imagine that Mineta gets you stuck on the ground. Meanwhile, this dinky that doesn't get dumb just shocks you down. reasons. These last guys tie in with a broader element of super school stories that is almost always present, the outside threat. Generally, mm -hmm. the stakes within the school setting are fairly artificial. A character might be struggling with a test or detention, but the bad consequences if they mess up are purposefully contrived. They might be punished by a teacher or receive a grade they aren't happy with, but it's constrained within a system that is designed to account for their failure. But outside mm -hmm. the school are real bad guys that don't care about school rules or regulations and have plans outside of who's going to prom with whom. The outside threat often makes its first appearance by interrupting a class field trip for yep the, the, you'll, uh, the, I literally mentioned this earlier no super school ever makes it past getting at least one time that they have some outside threat to attack them there I don't think there's a super school in fiction where there isn't at least one of these forcing the students and any attending teachers to use their training in a real combat situation. But field trips are far from the only stock adventure our hero will experience within the safe confines of school. Mm -hmm, For mm -hmm. one thing, there's class. Despite being statistically the thing our hero will spend most of their school time doing, it's actually a complete 50-50 shot if it's ever actually featured on screen. For the simple reason that watching a character sit silently in a classroom while a teacher tells them things is not automatically interesting to watch. But while class might be sidelined, classism won't be. Super schools mm -hmm. love having some kind of internal hierarchy system the students can be sorted into, be it dorms or- The rich people's house and the poor. Oh, you thought I was gonna say poor people's house? No, it's a poor people's shack. Houses or tracks, with one slice of the hierarchy reserved for the privileged assholes and another dingier slice reserved for the scrappy underdogs. So, um, we have our lovely gated community and then we have your run-down hole-in-the-wall flea bitten cockroaches in the floorboards fucking duplex. You'll be over there in the duplex. Our hero will inevitably find themselves in scrappy underdog house along with their closest friends and conflict will inevitably ensue. Of course, when our hero eventually breaks the rules obviously enough to get caught, they will find themselves experiencing the school's patented detention that violates the Geneva Convention. This will <laughs> conflict for the episode by being somewhere on the spectrum. I literally was just thinking of fucking the Owl House right then and there. It's like, detention that violates the Geneva Convention. <laughs> 
spectrum from frustrating to absolutely unconscionable. The danger level of the detention might be increased by machinations of the obligatory teacher that doesn't like the hero or possibly outside intervention from bad mm -hmm. guys, but its base level of badness is often pretty ridiculous, frequently inexplicably so. When the story feels like mixing things up and leaning into the character no. for an episode, the school Don't. will put on a big dance, usually something oh, prom adjacent, okay. and let all the protagonists get dolled up in fun outfits and pair off with their respective love interests for some ship teasing. The odds of the big dance being interrupted by villainous machinations are moderately low, but never zero. No. And those villainous interruptions it, it, it are no joke. Often. In fact, they usually increase in severity until the story eventually reaches a breaking point of the school under siege. This mm -hmm. stock storyline can play out in a few different ways, but in general it signals a turning point in the story where the super school, hitherto a bastion of safety and artificial stakes, becomes compromised by the real threats of the outside world, endangering mm -hmm, the students mm -hmm. and upping the danger level of the story as a whole. This disruptive shift in the status quo is often traumatic and frightening as the heroes are exposed to levels of peril that the story previously protected them from just by virtue of tone. It's not uncommon for the school under siege to kick off a plotline where the hero or heroes actually leave the school and start adventuring in the wider world, leaving the pretenses of- Ah, don't you love it? When the one place that you thought was safe gets burned to the fucking ground and you have to start for nothing? <sighs> Smells like misery in the air the setting behind and exploring the actual grand scale threats that have been hiding beyond the walls. The school under siege is typically a darkest hour as the heroes realize how truly dangerous the world they live in is and how much they were being shielded by their teachers and faculty, but at the same time how thin those walls really were and how ephemeral the safety they promised. But don't worry, when the story needs a grand finale they'll probably come back for graduation. Mm -hmm, now there's mm -hmm. a few other stock elements of this trope that can be reliably expected to turn up in super school stories, but we've run down most of the really consistent bits already. And while it may sound like these stories are very formulaic, which isn't entirely wrong, there's still yes. a lot of room for narrative freedom in and around the confines of this setting. For one thing, a super school story doesn't need to spend all its time in the school. The protagonists can have regular home. adventures outside of it, with the super school being only one place they go for plot. And outside rules and regulations of the super school, the hero can get up to basically anything. And they I love the idea of a super school where you check in. It's kind of like superhero college, right? You're going in there, you're doing what you want. But the second you step off campus, you're back in hell. You're, you're going straight back to fucked up land. It was like, people are dying. People are getting fucked up. You're like, oh, shit. And you don't even realize how badly it's gotten. You're like, oh, yeah, I've been staying in the dorms for so long. You go back home, the world's burnt. Ooh. The idea of you don't talk to your family often. So you go into super school, you don't even check your phone anymore, you don't check the news or anything, you're just chilling, doing what you want in the dorms, comes the time for break, and you're like, oh, I went to superhero school, that way I could, you know, become a super soldier, go back home and, and, you know, train and stuff, right? And all you do is go back home, and you see nothing but a fucking burned down, destroyed town, nothing is left, the people you knew are gone. Actually, the only thing that you remember of them and you can see that lasted from them is the shadow of them that has been pasted upon the walls. Or would you say sandblasted upon the walls, I guess. Anyways, I'll let's continue. The consistent parts of the story are consistent for a reason. It really is very convenient for the writer to have access to a massive cast of characters, allies, enemies, and everything in between just on call whenever they need them because they're all on campus together. And the very mm -hmm. nature of a school setting provides the protagonist with an endless parade of small-scale conflicts and challenges. The characters can at any time be struggling with a lesson, prepping for or making up a test, swamped with homework, training, stuck in detention, wrangling a bully, or whatever. The purpose of a school is to challenge its students, so it's very <laughs> easy for a writer to wrangle a challenge out of the system of the school. The characters will never be bored, so the audience won't either. Right? Yeah! Right? Well... All episodic. these shows come with cons. Episodic also means formulaic, and even if we disregard the problems of repetition and storytelling, the stakes established within the boundaries of the super school are artificial, and can realistically only get so perilous before it becomes implausible that the adults and authority figures are not intervening. If a super school has stakes that are too high and too interesting, it can circle mm -hmm, around mm -hmm. to seeming both unbelievable and not all that fun. Now don't get me wrong, an escapist story doesn't need to pamper its protagonists with nothing but positivity. Half the fun of escapism is imagining oneself overcoming unimaginable peril in cool cinematic ways but there's a difference between excitingly dangerous and those are being thrown to the sank the scan oh my god the scantron hounds scantron hounds this is that's torturous 
the fuck is this? And you, you like, ah, uh, you should have bubbled in correctly, but you made one mark out. For every time you mark outside your bubble, will be one swing of my blade you must dodge. It's like, but aren't you the strongest sword fighter in the world? Yes. Why? That's that sounds really fucking cool. Like, no, I think, but it's like every time you scratch outside the bubble of your lines, you have to dodge a fucking sword swing mid test. You run around the classroom and you're like, fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> unfair and if a super school stakes get too for want of a better word mean it can start feeling like it'd be more trouble than it was worth to deal with it but of course if the school stakes are too low that just reminds the audience that the whole conflict is fundamentally unreal even within mm -hmm, the space mm -hmm. of the story the stakes are impressing or disappointing a teacher not anything tangibly meaningful and more broadly the characters are almost always going to be at their most interesting when they're outside the bounds of the regular school schedule yes. characters actively in class can't exactly do much chatting. Characters between classes can't do much beyond brief chats, so most character shenanigans have to happen after or outside of school, making the primary setting of the story an active hindrance to the plot a lot of the time. Not much more than an inciting incident and a common goal to keep the heroes hanging out with each other. But there almost always comes a time when the heroes leave the super school behind, uh. when they enter the wider world of complex stakes and unstructured time and genuine threats. And that's usually when the story starts getting really good. The characters get the chance mm -hmm. to discover who they are when they aren't being defined by scores and grades. They get to choose their destiny, prepared by their schooling for a big scary world of adventure. After all, the one truth of every school is that one day every student will stop being a student mm -hmm, and get the chance mm -hmm. to be a person instead. And I gotta say, being a person's a lot more fun. So, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. The links will be in the description, by the way, so you can go and support OSP. They're really fucking fun people will listen to and watch.